we stopped in 1 Kings chapter 21 with the unjust execution of Navot, the owner of a, of a piece of land that the wicked and self-serving king of Israel wanted for his own enjoyment. This land was adjacent to Ahab's, and, and it, it was Jezebel's favorite palace, which was located in the lush and serene Jezreel Valley. Now, when King Ahab approached this Navot with the proposition of either buying his land with money or trading with him for another piece of property, Navot was indignant and he boldly told Israel's king that such a thing was impossible because for him it was the land of his heritage. That is, the vineyard grew on his ancestral family tribal land land that had been allotted going all the way back to Moses and Joshua. And the Torah law prohibited selling such property to someone outside of his clan or his tribe. Now the infantile king went into his palace bedroom. He lay sulking in his bed. He refused to take food. And this, of course, drew the attention of his wicked wife, Jezebel, who promised to remedy this situation for him. Now, Jezebel was always the stronger one, the more bolder of the, of the royal couple. And her solution was to arrange for a false accusation of blasphemy to be leveled against Navot during some kind of a contrived religious convocation that involved a fast. The town's leading dignitaries, their elders or judges were invited to this gathering for the purpose of carrying out swift justice. In a matter of a few hours, Navot lay stoned to death and Jezebel declared the deceased land forfeit to the state. The minute King Ahav was given the good news, he quit his pouting. And he set out for Navot's vineyard to claim that land. However, as he drove on his chariot, an old adversary of his suddenly showed up and he ruined King Ahab's jubilant, jubilant mood. Let's pick up at 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 17. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, that's page 397. 397. 1 Kings chapter 21, starting at verse 17. <clears throat> but the word of Adonai came to Eliyahu, Elijah from Tishbe. Get up and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Shomron, Samaria. Right now he's in the vineyard of Nevot. He's gone down there to take possession of it. This is what you're to say to him. Here is what Adonai says. You have committed murder. Now you're stealing the victim's property. Also say to him, here is what Adonai says. In the very place where dogs licked up the blood of Navot, dogs will lick up your blood, yours. Ahav said to Eliyahu, my enemy, you found me. And he answered, yes, I have found you. Because you've given yourself over to do what is evil from Adonai's perspective. Here, says Adonai, I'm bringing disaster on you. I'll sweep you away completely. I'll cut you off from a I'll cut off from Ahav, every male, whether a slave or free, in Israel. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, like the house of Baasha, the son of, ah, uh, of Ahiah, for provoking my anger and leading Israel into sin. Adonai also said this about Isabel, Jezebel. The dogs will eat Jezebel by the wall around Jezreel. If someone from the line of Ahab dies in the city, the dogs will eat him. If he dies in the countryside, the vultures, vultures will eat him. Truly, there was never anyone like Ahab. Stirred up by his wife Jezebel, he gave himself over to do what's evil from Adonai's perspective. His behavior when following idols was grossly abominable. He did everything the Amorites had done, whom Adonai had expelled ahead of the people of Israel. Now Ahab, on hearing these words, tore his clothes and put sackcloth on himself, and he fasted. 
He slept in the sackcloth, and he went about de dejectedly. Then the word of Adonai came to Eliyahu from Tishbe. Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Since he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring this evil during his lifetime. But during his son's lifetime, I will bring this evil on his house. The venerable Elijah suddenly returns to the scene and he confronts King Ahab. Now we don't know how much time has passed since Eliyahu's encounter with God on Mount Horeb when he essentially resigned his commission as a prophet because of a bad attitude. Now no doubt he has rethought matters. He's repented and Jehovah has allowed Elijah back into the Lord's service but as a humbled man. Now it, it ought to provide us all with great hope when we remember that the Lord did not discard Elijah. Elijah withdrew from the Lord and from service to him. Yet there's a warning. It doesn't have to be the end of our service to God because we have erred. But it is possible and likely that some of the great things that could have been ours to do in God's name will now be given over to someone else, some other willing person. And as we move into 2 Kings, we see that indeed Elisha will become the preeminent prophet of his day. He will accomplish the things that Elijah might otherwise have done. So we find starting in verse 19 that this old prophet speaks boldly in the name of the Lord and he no longer invokes himself as having power and authority to bring about calamity as he did when he proclaimed a drought over Israel that lasted for three years and said it wouldn't end until he personally ordered it. And the message that Elijah brings is a stinging prophecy that begins by calling Ahab a murderer and a thief. And for doing these despicable things, the Lord's oracle says, a King Ahab will die a grisly death and there will be shameful treatment of his corpse, which is going to be thrown into Navot's vineyard and the dogs will lap up his blood. I, I think it can be fairly said that the Holy Scriptures paint a picture of Ahab as perhaps the most sinful king ever to rule over Israel, at least up to this point. And yet, we're going to find that despite all of this, King Ahab would take to heart his sins, and the Lord would relent to a degree on his ordained punishments, and rather some of his terrible sentence would be carried out upon Ahab's Son. Now we've seen this pattern before in the Bible. Then we'll find in 2 Kings chapter 9 that it was Ahab's son Yoram, Joram, who had his corpse cast upon Navot's land. Listen to 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 24, 25, 26. Yehu drew his bow with all of his strength and he struck. Yoram between the shoulder blades. The arrow went through his heart and he collapsed in his chariot. Pick him up, said Yehu to Bidkar, his servant, and throw him into the field of Navot, the Yesrele, the, the Jezreelite. For remember how, when you and I were riding together after King Ahab, his father, Adonai pronounced this sentence against him. Adonai says, yesterday I saw the blood of Navot and the blood of his sons. Adonai also says, I will pay you back in this field. Therefore, pick him up and throw him into the field, in keeping with what Adonai said. The great Rabbi Maimonides, called the Rambam, writes that the spilling of human blood in an unjust manner, murder, harms the very fabric of human civilization more than any other crime. Because it is the ultimate crime of human against human 
in God's eyes. And one of the many biblical proofs of this is that despite his serial acts of rebellion and evil, even committing the most determined sort of idolatry, it was only when he murdered that King Ahab was finally condemned to death by God. But also notice that Ahab didn't personally participate in Nebuchadnezzar's execution. Nor was he even present at this phony blasphemy trial of Nebot's. Even more, it was his wife, Jezebel, who thought up this entire plot and ordered it carried out. But Ahab knew about it, and he completely condoned it. And as king, he was fully responsible for it. It is quite similar to King David. When he arranged things so that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, would be conveniently killed in battle. That is, it was even an enemy soldier who struck the fatal blow upon Uriah. But David wanted it. He orchestrated it. And so Uriah's blood was on David's head. And the price he paid for it was that Bathsheba's first child would die and David would never be allowed to accomplish the thing that David so greatly desired to achieve, the building of the first temple. Now God's kings and leaders bear the greatest responsibility among humans on earth. They also receive the greatest accolades, reap some of the greatest rewards, even heavenly blessings, when they do what's right in the Lord's eyes. And because leadership on earth is so difficult and challenging, and the temptations of power and authority can be overwhelming, it seems as if Jehovah will often show greater mercy to his kings and to his leaders. Yet, in the end, these kings and leaders will be held accountable, not just for their own sins, but for the communal sins of the group or the nation that they lead, so the sword cuts both ways. Now verse 20 makes it clear that King Ahab sees Elijah as an enemy, as an adversary. And this is because it seems as though where other kings have prophets, that bring them good tidings and often proclaim happy things. All Elijah ever does is bring oracles of judgment upon King Ahav. But the thing is that as Jehovah's prophet, Elijah is merely bringing God's word to the king of Israel. That's all he's doing. But Ahav hates God's word because it exposes his sin. It exposes his rebellion. See, this is a good illustration of why people of, of all ages, since the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, have found reason to despise or declare irrelevant God's commandments of the Torah. It's because looking into that Torah is like holding up a mirror to our lives. And the reflection we see is what God sees. Sometimes it isn't very pretty. We all want to think of ourselves as good people, righteous people. But most people want to make that evaluation according to our own standards. And King Ahav was no different. So beginning in verse 21, God's condemnation of Ahab continues by telling him that not only will Ahab's life be terminated, but so will his dynasty end, just as happened with Jeroboam. And further, his wife, Queen Jezebel, will die a miserable death. And the wild dogs that always around, uh, ran around in packs outside uh, the uh, city walls, they would lick up the blood of her wounds. 
And the divine reason for this is because A, Ahab has given himself over to evil, and B, the wicked royal couple has led the people of Israel into sin, mainly the sin of idolatry. Now, a terrible epitaph that none of us would ever want to hear read concerning us is proclaimed about Ahab, king of Israel. And I think this is what it's going to be like at the great white throne judgment when our lives are laid bare before us from God's perspective. And then we are judged accordingly. Verse 25 says, he was the worst king ever to rule Israel. That he gave in to his evil wife, Jezebel. And that this led to his worshiping idols, and he did everything that God despised, even about the Amorites. King Ahab was a sad, violent man who recognized on the one hand that Jehovah is God. But at the same time, he lived an ungodly life. He worshiped false gods. He murdered. He behaved like a people, the Amorites, that God essentially ordered wiped out because they were so abominable in his sight. This is a good teaching moment to remind us all that believing in God, hear me, believing in God is not the same thing as trusting in God. Ahav believed in God, but he didn't trust in God. Rather, he trusted in idols, and he trusted in the ways of the world. James, brother of Yeshua, addresses this matter head on in one of his more famous quotes from James 2.19. You believe God is one? God is a chad? Good for you. The demons believe it too. The thought makes them shudder with fear. So the good news is that you believe in God puts you right on par with the demons. Simply believing that God exists essentially only makes one not an atheist. But that's about it. No other merit is imputed upon us for mere belief in God. As James said, even the demons believe that. And so just as the demons shudder in fear at the thought that God is, and yet they are by definition of definition they are incapable of doing any other than giving their trust and allegiance to the evil one so in verse 27 we find king ahav performing the customary jewish rites of repentance and mourning tearing one's clothes and wearing that itchy old sackcloth and though this was real it was shallow and it would be of no lasting effect, and he would just quickly return to his evil master. See, it's fascinating to me that when Elijah observes King Ahab's dejected demeanor and behavior as a result of God's prophetic curse, the Lord now uses this as a teaching moment for Elijah. The Lord says something to Elijah that is not intended to be relayed to the king. But rather, it's like when he was on Mount Horeb. It was personal. It was personal between God and Elijah. And the, here's what the Lord says in 1 Kings 21, 29. Elijah, do you see how Ahav has humbled himself before me? And since he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring this evil during his lifetime, but during his son's lifetime, I'll bring the evil on his house. And as I mentioned earlier, since Ahav is king of Israel, a portion at least of God's people, 
Even though he bears great responsibility and he's going to suffer great accountability as Israel's leader, it seems to be God's way to offer some measure of mercy wherever possible. Even if only for a few brief days, King Ahab has humbled himself before God. It is sufficient to delay some of God's sentence upon him and kick that can down the road to the next generation of Ahab's family. Despite that, the full measure of God's justice, as promised, will happen. Because God's holy and his justice demands it. And the Lord is explaining all this to Eliel, Elijah, who it seems has always had trouble showing mercy and being gentle. Remember the symbolism of the wind and the earthquake and the fire back at Mount Horeb? Elijah's temperament was to be rigid, to be severe. And often his first thought was to punish. Thank heavens, that's not God's temperament. Now let's move on to 1 Kings chapter 22. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're on page 398. First Kings chapter 22. We're going to read it all. <clears throat> For three years there was no war between Aram, Syria, and Israel. Then in the third year, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Are you aware that remote Gilead belongs to us, yet we're doing nothing to recover it from the king of Aram? And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go down with me to attack remote Gilead? And Jehoshaphat answered the king of Israel, I'm with you all the way. Think of my troops and horses as yours. But Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, But first, we should seek the word of Adonai. So the king of Israel assembled the prophets, about 400 men. Should I attack remote Gilead, he asked them, or should I hold off? And they said, Attack! Adonai will hand it over to the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Besides these, isn't there a prophet of Adonai here that we can consult? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Yes, there is still one man through whom we can consult Adonai, Michal, the son of Yimlah. <laughs> but I hate him, because he doesn't ever prophesy good things for me, just bad. Jehoshaphat replied, The king shouldn't say such a thing. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Quickly, bring Michal, the son of Yimlah. Now, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were each sitting on his throne, dressed in their royal robes on the threshing floor at the entrance to the gate of Shomron, Samaria. All the prophets were there, prophesying in their presence. Zidkiah, the son of Cananiah, had made himself some horns out of iron. And he said, this is what Adonai says. With these you will gore Aram until they're destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied the same thing. Go up and attack remote Gilead. You'll succeed, for Adonai will hand it over to the king. And the messenger who had gone to call Michal said to him, Here, now, the prophets are unanimously predicting success for the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them. Say something good. But Michal answered, As the Lord lives, whatever Adonai says to me is what I will say. And when he reached the king, the king asked him, Michal, should we go up and attack remote Gilead or show, should we hold off? And he answered, Go up, you will succeed, and Adonai will hand it over to the king. And the king said to him, How many times do I have to warn you to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of Adonai? And then he said, I saw all Israel scattered over the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And Adonai said, These men have no leader. 
let everyone go home in peace. And the king of Adonai said, Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you he'd prophesy? He wouldn't prophesy good things about me, but bad. And Mikael continued, therefore, hear the word of Adonai. I saw Adonai sitting on his throne with the whole army of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And Adonai asked, who will go and entice Ahab to go up to his death? Got a remote Gilead. And one of them said, do it this way. Another said, do it that way. And then a spirit stepped up and stood in front of Adonai and said, I'll go and entice him. And Adonai asked, how? And he answered, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets. And Adonai said, you will succeed in enticing him. Go, do it. So now Adonai has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. Meanwhile, Adonai has ordered disaster for you. Then Zitkiah, the son of Canaanah, came up and he slapped Mikiel in the face. And he said, how did the spirit of Adonai leave me to speak to you? And Mikiel said, you'll find out the day you go inside a room trying to hide. And the king of Israel said, seize Mikiel, take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and Yoash the king's son, and say, this king says to this man, says, put this man in prison. Feed him only bread and water, and not much of that, till I return in peace. Mikiel said, if you return in peace at all, Adonai is not spoken through me. Then he added, did you hear me, you peoples, all of you? So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to remote Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I'll disguise myself and go into battle, but you, you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered the 32 chariot commanders, don't attack anyone of either high or low rank, but only the king of Israel. So when the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they said, well, this must be the king of Israel. And they turned to attack him. But Jehoshaphat gave a yell so that the chariot commanders saw that he wasn't the king of Israel and they stopped pursuing him. However, one soldier shot an arrow at random. And it struck the king of Israel between his lower armor and his breastplate. So the king said to his chariot driver, turn the reins and take me out of this fighting. I'm collapsing from my wounds. But the fighting grew fiercer that day, and they propped the king upright in his chariot, facing Aram until he died in the evening with the blood streaming from his wound onto the floor of his chariot. Around sundown, a cry spread through the ranks. Every man to his own town, every man to his own land. So the king died, and he was brought to Shomron, and there and they buried the king in Shomron. They washed the chariot at the pool of Shomron, where the prostitutes bathed. The, do the dogs licked up his blood in keeping with the word Adonai had spoken. Other activities of Achav's reign, all of his accomplishments, the ivory palace he built, all of the cities he built, are recorded in the annals of the kings of Israel. So Achav slept with his ancestors, and Ahaziah, his son, became king in his place. Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began his reign over Judah in the fourth year of Achav, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he began to rule, and he ruled for 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuvah, the daughter of Shilhi. He lived in the manner of Asa, his father, and he did not turn away from it, doing what was right from Adonai's perspective. And although the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and presented offerings on those high places. Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Other activities of Jehoshaphat, all his power that he demonstrated, how he made war, are recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. He rid the land of the male and female cult prostitutes remaining from the time of his father, Asa. There had previously been no king in Edom, but now a deputy was made king. Jehoshaphat built some large Tarshish ships to go to Ophir for gold, but they didn't make the voyage because they were wrecked at Etzion Geber. 
Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, suggested to Jehoshaphat that his men should go to sea with Jehoshaphat's men, but Jehoshaphat wouldn't agree. So Jehoshaphat slept with his ancestors, and he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David, his ancestor, and Jehoram, his son, became king in his place. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began his reign over Israel in Shomron in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he ruled for two years over Israel. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective, living in the manner of his father, his mother, and Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, by which he led Israel into sin. He also served Baal. He worshipped him. And he made Adonai, the God of Israel, angry in keeping with everything his father had done. The first verse says that for three years there was no war between Aram and, with, and Israel. That means that the alliance between Ben-Hadad of Syria, Aram, and King Ahab of Israel had held firm from the day that Ahab had captured Ben-Hadad in battle and then called him my brother and then next made a peace treaty with him and freed him up until the time of our story that begins chapter 22. However, that doesn't mean that Israel or Syria had been nations at peace during that same time period. Now, Israel had only months earlier fought an important war to blunt the aggression of Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. Note that Assyria is not the same as Syria. In fact, Syria and Israel fought side by side against Shalmaneser of Assyria and won a decisive battle at Karkur that's located on the east bank of the Orontes River. Now Shalmaneser had empire building in mind and he was on the march to gain more territory and in fact he had already conquered a number of smaller nations up in Mesopotamia to begin creating his vision of an Assyrian empire. Now you recall that one of the le reasons that Ben-Hadad had invaded Israel's capital of Samaria some years earlier was that Israel was an enemy on its southern border and Assyria was an enemy on its northern and eastern borders and such a situation just presented too much of an existential threat for Syria to let it stand. Ben-Hadad calculated that Israel would be a lot easier opponent to control so he invaded them with a numerically superior force, but miraculously he lost. And ironically, that loss resulted in a peace treaty with Israel. Now those two nations work together to defeat Assyria, the much larger threat to the entire region. Verse 2 reports that the king of Judah at this time was Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat. And that he paid a state visit to King Ahab up in Israel, the northern territories. And although we aren't told in this chapter how it is that Ahab and Jehoshaphat had begun these friendly relations, we find out in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 18, that they had become allied through marriage. That is, Jehoshaphat's son, Joram, had married Ahab's and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. The only purpose for this arranged marriage was to create a strong alliance between Judah and Israel. So what we find is that for many years before Jehoshaphat ventured up to Israel, Judah and Israel were on peaceful terms. But Jehoshaphat wanted to cement a yet closer relationship. Ahab and Jezebel agreed, and so their offspring married. And again, while the scriptures don't necessarily give us a particular reason for Jehoshaphat making his state visit up to Israel, the context seems to indicate that it wasn't merely for pleasure or for diplomatic purposes. Rather, it was to explore a possible plan of battle utilizing their joint forces to take the city of remote Gilead away from Aram, away from Syria. There was nothing 
in the peace treaty between Israel and Ben-Hadad that specifically said they had to give remote Gilead back to Israel. However, this was an important city because it was strategically located on the King's Highway trade route. This was all about economics. Whoever controlled remote Gilead controlled the commerce along this section of the route. They could extract taxes from all these traveling merchants. They could more effectively protect their own merchants and their government shipments, or they could ban certain products that they wanted their own nation to produce and to control to the exclusion of all others. Now, remote Gilead was in Gad's former, former uh, tribal territory on the east side of the Jordan River. So, for King Ahab to say that remote Gilead used to belong to us meant that it used to be Israeli territory. He was appealing to Jehoshaphat as a descendant of Jacob, not as either a Judahite or as one of the ten northern tribes. And He was saying that remote Gilead was territory that had been allotted by Moses, so it was Hebrew ancestral land. Jehoshaphat was all in. He agreed to go to war with Ahab and said he would contribute some number of troops from Judah. But he had one hesitation. He first wanted to seek the word of God. Smart man. In other words, Jehoshaphat wanted to use either a priest or a prophet to discern the will of God so that he'd know the outcome in advance. That was completely typical for a Middle Eastern monarch in that era. Well, King Ahab agreed to this, and in verse 6 he called for an assembly of 400 of his prophets in order to divine an answer. Should I attack remote Gilead or not? He asked them, and they unanimously said, attack! The Lord will hand it over to the king. Now the Hebrew word used here for Lord is Adonai, a generic term meaning Lord or Master. So we should not think that they necessarily had Jehovah God in mind but might have, or at least they perhaps had in, their, had in mind their own perception of, uh, of who or what Jehovah was, but these 400 are not related now to the 400 prophets of Baal or Astarte that we heard about in the earlier chapters. This is yet another group of prophets from some unidentified prophet colony. Now, most Hebrew scholars say these were golden calf worshippers who viewed those golden calf idols of Dan and Bethel the same way Jeroboam had a few decades earlier as representatives or as representations rather or molten images of Jehovah God of Israel. Now interestingly, King Jehoshaphat of Judah, he wasn't comfortable with either the prophets or their answer. He wanted to know if there wasn't at least one old school prophet of Jehovah still around in Israel, as opposed to all these new politically correct groups of prophets who were basically just yes-men for their king and queen. Now, apparently Elijah hadn't resurfaced just yet. So even as the most obvious choice, King Ahab didn't mention him because he had no idea where he was. So he did think of one prophet of Jehovah, a fellow named Michal, son of Yimla. But I really don't like that guy very much, says Ahav, because he always says bad things are going to happen to me. Now Jehoshaphat told Ahav that he shouldn't say things like that about a true prophet of Jehovah, and so Ahav relented and he, he called for one of his officers to go and get Michal. Now it's important that we understand that pagans, and no doubt Ahav, believed that prophets didn't only announce the will of the gods, they also influenced the gods. And they could even get the gods to do the will of the prophets. Ahav hated Mikiel because he wouldn't get on the team. He just wouldn't tell the king what he wanted to hear. The king believed that when Michal prophesied something bad, he could bring it about 
by getting God to do his will. So the king had imprisoned Michal so he wouldn't prophesy bad things to the king. And therefore, in his muddled thinkings, now bad things won't happen to me. Well, when Michal arrives, the two kings are sitting together on their thrones near the city gates of Samaria, Shomron. And apparently this area was also used as a threshing floor because of its, its flatness and hardness. No doubt it was probably even paved with stones. Although it had also served as the town square where court was held, where business deals were concluded, it was located just outside the city gates where a breeze could, could blow through. That way the grain could be winnowed. But in the hot summer, which is probably the season of the year of the story, it was much cooler than being inside the walled city because that blocks all the breezes. The 400 prophets were all there prophesying, meaning they were chanting and they were swaying and they were engaged in all manner of ecstatic activity. I mean, you can only imagine the noise and the chaos of 400 of these dudes going nuts. Suddenly, one particular prophet emerges. Zedekiah, the son of Canaanah. Now, whether he was the head of this particular prophet guild or from some other one, we're not told, but he invokes the name of Jehovah God and he uses rather standard prophet protocol and he says, these are the words of Jehovah God. He had fashioned a pair of animal horn symbols using metal. So he used them as a metaphor, as an illustration. And he said that the, Israel would gore Syria until they were destroyed. The, this line of thought was no doubt taken from the Torah. In Deuteronomy 33, we're told this in verses 15 through 17. With the best from the mountains of old, with the best from the eternal hills, with the best from the earth and all that fits it, and the favor of him who lived in the burning bush, may blessing come on the head of Joseph on the brow of the prince among his brothers. His firstborn bull glory is his. His horns are those of a wild ox. With them he will gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. These are the myriads of Ephraim. These are the thousands of Manasseh. Well, here they were in the territory of the Joseph tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim Israel, as it was now starting to be known. And they were about to go attack an enemy. So Zedekiah borrows the metaphor of the wild ox horns from the Torah, and he uses it as a sign from God that there will be victory over a ram. And we probably would be right to assume that the two kings knew this scripture verse, or it wouldn't have had very much of an impact on them. The other prophets agreed in unison with Zidkiel, and once again invo invoking Jehovah's name, repeated that Israel would win handily at remote Gilead. Now, needless to say, King Ahab was thrilled, since these prophets were echoing what he wanted to hear. And he was no doubt feeling his oats, because over the past few years, King Ahab had known three miraculous and very unlikely military victories, two of them over a realm, once over that growing behemoth called Assyria. The name of Ahab would have carried a lot of fear and admiration in the Middle East. So by combining his forces with Jehoshaphat's, remote Gilead was bound to be a pushover. Besides, he was feeling pretty invincible. Well, the guard who had fetched Mikiel from his prison cell saw what was happening. And knowing that the king hated Mikiel because he always seemed to be a wet blanket, he tried to give the king some friendly advice. Just go with the flow. Can't he see that these 400 prophets are making the king happy? They're predicting a grand victory. Just go with the flow. Just say what they're saying. For Pete's sake, say something good for a change. 
But that party killer, Mickey Yao, told the guard he was going to say whatever God told him to say. One can imagine the guard heaving a big sigh about now and just shaking his head in disgust at Mickey Yao is when he if he just compromise, just just a little, the king would be so happy, and all those prophets would be so happy, and, Mika and Mickey Yao just might get released from prison, maybe even get a reward. What a deal! Well, let's end this evening's lesson with this thought. It's man's ways to compromise. It's not God's. It is man's ways to be people pleasers, not God's. But this human desire to compromise has significantly infected and affected the modern church such that to not compromise is today seen as mean-spirited, intolerant, and perhaps backward if not unintelligent. So many pastors and preachers operate their congregations today by compromise and consensus so they you don't rock the boat. Others are concerned with not using God's word to chastise or offend their flocks, but rather to just go along to get along so that the people will keep coming. Everybody will be happy. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay together. Nobody wants to hear that their behavior or their theology is wrong-minded or that what they call good is actually evil and vice versa. But when I refer to the negative effect of compromise on the body of Christ, I'm not referring to issues and decisions that involve just human preference. What color do we paint the building? Do we have carpet or do we have tile on the floor? What times and days should we have our, our meetings and our worship services? Should we have free coffee? Or should we charge a little bit for it? Should the children be allowed in with the adults in the main service? Or should they be separated? Rather, I'm speaking about moral matters of divine biblical commandment that ought never to be compromised. I don't care if half the congregation left or feels dissension. Do we acknowledge Yeshua as Savior, or could it be somebody else? Is there one way to salvation, or might there be many paths to God? Is Israel still God's chosen people, or has the Gentile church replaced them? Should we see the Palestinians as victims of Israel and side with them? Or should we stand with Israel and declare their inalienable right to their own land? Is Jehovah God, or is Allah God? Or are they one and the same? Is one religion's holy book as worthy as any other? See, to compromise on preference is to seek godly peace. To compromise on God's immutable laws and principles, that's sin. Mickey Yao decided he'd rather spend the rest of his life in prison or even lose it all together than to compromise on God's word even one time so that he could get along better with the world, even with his peers. May it be so with each of us as Messiah's followers today. We're going to continue next time. Please rise.
心。